evening. Just let you know, no lapel mic. Uh, good evening, church family. Amen. It's so good to be here with you and to worship with you again this evening. Uh, maybe it's me, maybe it's not, uh, but uh, from the prayers to the singing, uh, to the enthusiasm before we got started, it seems as though there's a lot of life in the congregation for a Sunday evening. And uh, I really appreciate that. Maybe that singing we did beforehand, David, primed us a little bit. Uh, but it was wonderful to get to sing then. It's wonderful to get to sing now. David and all of our song leaders do such a great job. And uh, your voices uh, sound beautiful. And uh, the uh, intent behind the voice is even more beautiful. Um, as you have there on the screen, we're going to be talking from James chapter 3 this evening. James chapter 3. And before we get there, let me just say that we have a whole lot of people sick and struggling. It's physical illnesses, as uh, was prayed. But, you know, I used to like separating the physical body, the spiritual body, the, the uh, mental state, the emotional state, the social state, the financial state. You know, really, they all go together. When you read God's Word, if someone has afflictions of the flesh, it can affect them emotionally and it can aff affect them spiritually. And so when we think about, as, as Daniel very, and very well worded in his prayer stated, we've got so many people that are afflicted in many ways. I mean physically, but when you're afflicted, afflicted physically, it, it bothers you emotionally. There are those who have lost loved ones, and certainly you can be so emotionally afflicted that, uh, afflicted that it actually impacts you physically. And so we have so many people, a part of our family here, who need our prayers. I normally don't do any visits on uh, Sunday, but I did four visits today and the first one was down to see Linda Cruz and uh, there was some family down there of course and I'm mentioning this because Rob asked me to share this without giving a lot of details away at this time Linda is doing some better than she was earlier today and she is expected to ha uh, find a place possibly at Solaris and be moved there so keep her in your prayers um, there's a lot that she is uh, dealing with. Uh, in addition to her physical health, of course, she lost her husband. So please keep Miss Linda and her family, uh, John Paul and Paula and the whole family and all the grandkids in your prayers at this time. Please also was able to go see Betty. Had a wonderful visit with Betty. Also was able to see Wes and that lady that we baptized The uh, that's also over in Solaris. There's a lot of people who could... And by the way, I know that you're visiting them because when I visit these people, they tell me, so-and-so just stopped by. Or I signed my name in on the list and I see three church members that were there before me. So we have a congregation that has a vested interest in the affairs of one another. And that's, that demonstrates that we really are, in the sense that the Bible speaks of a family, continue to encourage them. I'll say this, that when we read the book of James, to me it sounds a whole lot like the book of Proverbs. And so I've got two passages that I want to study with you this evening. One is James chapter 3 verses 1 through 12, and the other is Proverbs 15 verses 1 through 4, and maybe we'll just call that our two points. Okay, so when we jump into James chapter uh, 3, I, I can't help but think of that song that I've heard small children sing in, in VBS or at Pew Packers or in times like that, and I always get the order of the lyrics mixed up, but the song goes something like this. This. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little hands, what you do. And be careful, little mouths, what you say. You know, James tells us one of the most challenging things in faithfulness to God is controlling and taming the words that come out of our mouth. And James really gets straight to the point in James 3 and verse number 1 when he says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. The word teacher can kind of be understood in the sense of imparting knowledge, instructing people, but it can also kind of be understood as this idea of having a conversation with someone. Obviously, in this passage and in the Bible, having a conversation with someone about Jesus. 
And right off the bat, he issues a warning in this passage, and the warning is directed at teachers, those who will instruct others, those who will teach the gospel to others. And he says, don't let many of you become teachers. And he goes on to say, because they will receive the stricter judgment. Verse number 2, for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. So I say this to say that James issues a warning here to all all of us, let me say, but specifically to teachers. And as someone who serves in a role like a teacher in a, the biblical sense, I've got to say that I've always made a special note of this passage. It's always raised my radar and it's always sent the message to me, TJ, everybody needs to be careful with their words. But you have a, a, a pulpit, literally speaking, before the congregation. You especially need to be extra, extra careful with your words. Now let's think for a moment how a teacher, how a preacher, or someone like that may misuse their words. Well, um, let's use the preacher because I are one, as the English teacher once told me. Let's use that example for a minute. And uh, do, am I as a preacher a human like anyone else? Yes. Do I have emotions like anyone else? Yes. When someone says something that stings, do you think that I have the, in, the, the uh, desire to say something that stings back initially? Do you think I have that desire like you do? Do, do you think sometimes that, that, that those who teach us, whether it's the preacher, whether it's the youth minister, whether it's the teachers in our Bible classes, a visiting speaker, do you think that it's very, very, very easy for someone who says as many words on a given day or a given week as most of our Bible teachers do, do you think it's extra easy for those people to misuse their words? The answer is yes. So as a teacher, the message is that I've got to pay close attention. I've got to be extra careful because the pulpit or the classroom, the opportunity to teach someone the gospel, it is not an opportunity to let my words from an emotional state come out. It is not, um, it, it is not my prerogative, if you will, to let words from a state of opinion come out as though they are true. You know, when I read this passage, the very first thing comes to mind is when a teacher of the gospel teaches anything, he needs to study, 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 and make sure what he says is biblically factual. That's what this passage means, right? But can you say something that is biblically factual, but it still hurt people? Yes. Now, I'm not talking about speaking the truth in love and someone being offended by the truth, but do, is it important to give some consideration as to how we say things? And here's something that you know this because this exists in your life, but it's, it's on steroids when you're in the position of a preacher or teacher. And that is, it's not only important for me to pay close attention to the things that I'm teaching as truth, that they are doctrinally sound. It's not only important that I say them in a loving and tactful way. It's not only important that I say them in such a way that, that does not attack people or use this as a platform to attack people. But you know what's also important that is the biggest challenge? I think every single person in this room when the words come out of my mouth they go through the filter of your mind 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 and how many times do you believe I am heard saying something that I never intended does that happen to you that happens with husband and wife doesn't it that happens with us that happens with teachers and preachers as well so when the Bible says not let many of you become teachers one of the biggest nerve-wracking thoughts to me is, TJ, you've not only give consideration to the truth of it, not only to the kindness of it, not only to the tactfulness of it, but you've got to give consideration how will these particular people hear that. And that's hard when you're speaking to 50 people, 100 people, 183 people like we had a few Sundays ago. And so I ask of you, number one, I ask of you patience because I'm a human and I misuse my words. Uh, I'm a human and sometimes my words are perceived in a way that is offensive when that is not the intent. And I ask for your forgiveness when I outright say something that I should not have said. There are things that I've said in my preaching that someone challenged me on. I went back and looked at the passage and lo and behold, I was incorrect on a statement. 
That, that happens quite often if you're in our Bible classes. And in the past month or so, I said something very quickly when a comment arose at the end of Bible class, and I stated my opinion in a rather strong way. And you know what I did as soon as I got in my truck to drive home? It hit me. I just pushed my opinion as though it was truth. I need to make an apology. And so the next Bible class, I made an apology to... Here's what I'm saying is that in the Scriptures, we all are commanded to be careful with our words, but if we are going to take the role of teacher, preacher, whatever it is, we need to be held to the standard of doing our best to use our words to glorify God, to uplift the brethren, to encourage our brethren, not to tear people down, not to discourage people. And I would also say, if all of that is true, is it not also true that we show some patience? That we, show, that we give people the benefit of the doubt, that we, um, if something bothers us, we talk to that person. You know, if something that I've ever said uh, you find to be disagreeable um, or incorrect or, or offensive, and it's something that you care enough about to tell someone else, please come and talk to me. Because one, I will either say, I was wrong, I shouldn't have said that. You're absolutely right, I was wrong. Or I will say, um, I'm sorry it made you feel that way. That's not my intention, though. Can you believe that I know my heart better than anyone else? And so I think this is an important discussion to have, don't you? Because this is something that I have just recently uh, have discovered. It has been an issue for some people, and they have a right to have that an issue because I should be careful with what I say, and I need to make that clear. So when the Bible offers this warning, he says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that you shall receive stricter judgment. I learned this early in my preaching when I went to preach at a congregation when I was about 24 years of age. And for some reason, I've never done this before nor since, and I knew better, but I was talking about Genesis chapter 3, and I was kind of in a hurry, and my mind was on the next thought, and I called the forbidden fruit in Genesis 3, I called it an apple, and at the invitation, I was standing up there just with no care in the world, singing the invitation song, an elder comes up to me and whispers in my ear, and he's not joking, and he says, are you going to straighten out this error, or am I going to have to do it for you? And I called him by name and I said, Brother, I have no idea what you're talking about. He said, You called the fruit an apple. Again, are you going to straighten out this error or am I going to have to do it for you? And I chuckled because I thought he was joking. And he said, This is no laughing matter. False doctrine has been preached. I said, I'll straighten it out. Please allow me to do that. Do you think sometimes we can get too nitpicky? Yeah, I learned that day that there is a stricter judgment in place literally from God and certainly even from our brethren. And, and you understand that going into it. So I aim to do better, but I also ask for your patience as I try to communicate well. You know, I was, uh, I've listened to several neuroscientists make this statement. They say the most complicated thing to their knowledge a human brain does is, is process language. Not just process language, but produce language. And, and the idea behind that is that far more than some of the most advanced mathematics, language is the most complicated thing that we know of, or one of the most complicated things we know of that our brains can do. And, that, and you know, if you think about it, language is difficult because you have all these words, you can put them together in nearly any order. In many sense, there's a lot of creativity involved. And you change your language based on the individual that you're talking to. Listen. I grew up talking in a family that if something was an elephant in the room, we addressed it and you were considered a coward if you didn't. Now, does everybody take to language like that? No, we live in a sensitive society. People's feelings get hurt all the time. So being someone who controls their words has to have the social awareness and the intellectual complexity to understand not only is it how I would want to receive it, but how would that particular person that I have come to know, how would they want to receive this? And by the way, that is, a, that is an area that is difficult to manage. But it's one that we must strive to manage. So number one, he gives us a warning in verse number one. Jump to verse number three and four. And he says in verse number three, Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. 
Look also at the ships, although they are very are, are they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot directs. Now, he's using bits in horses' mouths. You've been around farm animals, many of you, enough to know that you put a bit in a horse's mouth and you take the reins and you can steer that horse this way and that way. And that bit in comparison to that horse is very tiny and it doesn't have a lot of strength on its own, but put in the proper place and used in the right way, we see that the bit is very powerful at controlling the powerful creature called the horse. The same thing with a rudder. A rudder is very, very small on the back of a ship, but it can turn an enormous ship in any which direction in the sea. The tongue is a small member, but it is a powerful member of our body. And the tongue can, is so powerful that it can, it can heal broken hearts by an encouraging word, and it can shatter somebody heart with a discouraging word. The heart is, or the words of our mouth are so powerful is what verses 3 and 4 are hinting at. But go to verses 5 and 6. The Bible says, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a, fi a forest a little fire kindles. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by by hell. Point number one is a warning, specifically to those who teach. Point number two is the power of words as demonstrated by these two illustrations. Point number three is the danger of misusing our words. He compares the idea of misusing our words to a little spark or a little flame that ignites, say, a dry leaf, and that ignites a portion of the forest floor, and that sets on fire trees, and that sets on fire an entire forest. It may start with a small word that was spoken without care, but it may cause great harm or great danger in the lives of those around us that we love. Husbands, are we speaking kindly to our wives? Wives, are we speaking encouragingly and respectful to, our hus to your husbands? Church members, are we treating one another as we claim as family in the sense that we're here to uplift one another? The, wor uh, the words we use are powerful and misusing them can be very, very dangerous to say the least. Beginning, uh, but going, by the way, in verse number 7, he gives us a third point to consider. He says, Every kind of beast of, uh, and bird, uh, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed, and has been tamed by mankind, but no one can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. And that takes us back to verse number 2 where we started, where he says, For it, we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. A few words. This word stumble is not the word that we translate meaning we chose to rebel against God's law. That's not what this word means. The word stumble here really is the idea that we're trying to walk the right path, we're trying to do the right things, but we take a misstep. We, we, we accidentally, without intending to, step off the path. Have any of us ever accidentally, without intending to, used our words in a destructive way? I have. And it's important that we are warned by this and heed this warning in Scripture and be on guard against this. And he goes on to say that if you are able not to stumble in words, you are a perfect man. I like the way the Christian Standard Bible reads here that he is a mature person. The idea that a truly spiritual mature person is one who has learned how to, for the most part, tame this beast called the tongue, control our words. And all of this is very important in the passage. Now go down to verse number 9. In verse number 9 of this context, the Bible says, "...with it, with the words we use, we bless God..." Our Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Here's the outline of the James text. He gives us a warning. Not let not there be many teachers, knowing we shall receive a stricter judgment. He tells us the power of our words. He tells us the danger of misusing our words. He tells us the difficulty of taming our tongue or our words. And here he gives us a contradiction that ought not to be. 
And the contradiction that ought not to be is that with the same mouth, with the same voice, with the same tongue, we bless God and we curse our fellow man. The, the, the same voice, the same instrument we use to sing praises to God on Sunday morning, we turn around and make our spouse feel small. The same words that we use to give glory to God, we say something intentionally or unintentionally. Remember the word stumble kind of implies unintentional. We use it to discourage our brethren. And this is a warning to you and it's a warning to me because our words do mean something. He says, out of the same mouth proceed both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. He says, does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or grapevines bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. It's a passage that reminds us of the importance of taming the tongue. Let's go very quickly to the book of Proverbs. Some have called James the Proverbs of the New Testament. Let's go back to the book of Proverbs, chapter 15, and verse number 1, and I ask the question, after hearing everything James is saying regarding how we should tame our words and use them for good, or, or how we should tame our words, understanding the danger they can cause, the power that they, convey, that they have, possess, how then shall we use our words? Proverbs 15, verse number 1, he, let, let's just read the first four verses and I'll give you three bullet points and the lesson will be yours. He says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I don't even have to explain that. You know that's true, don't you? You know that's true. I know that's true. Do I always practice it though? No, sadly I don't. Why? Because my emotion or maybe my pride sometimes gets in the way of that. He says, the tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and on the good. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but per uh, perverseness in its breaks the spirit. Now, here's my bullet points on this passage. Verse number 1, it tells us to use our words to make peace. It's very easy to use our words to make war. It's very easy to use our words to discourage, but rather we're to use our words to make peace, to bring bonds between brothers and sisters. It is, our, it is the goal to use our words to encourage more than discourage. Verse number 2, use our words to speak that which is right. Lying is a temptation for many people for whatever reason. But we are to use our words to speak that which is factual, that which is correct, that which is right. That's how we are to use our words, to make peace and to speak that which is right. But I want to focus on verse number four. Notice the words, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. And he says the rest there. I, maybe I can put it this way. We are to use our words to heal. We are to use our words to create healing. Maybe in your family, you know someone or two people who don't speak. Maybe in your distant family or close family, you know a father and a son, a mother or a daughter, a brother or a sister, so on and so forth, who just will not speak, and if they do, it's very little. Words, as powerful as they are, as destructive as they can be if misused, words can be used to sit down and talk and heal, mend a relationship. There are some people having marital struggles. Words can be helpful, the right words, with the right intent, with the right heart. And so when we think about all of this, it reminds me and it reminds all of us that our words can be used for good. They can be used for that which is not so good. They can be used to heal. They can be used to break people. They can be used, and by the way, the word stumble implies unintentional. And I think sometimes we think amongst our, in our heads, well, I didn't mean to hurt you. Well, I didn't say you meant to hurt me. I said that you did hurt me. And what does a humble person do in that situation? They don't argue about the factual nature with what was said and what wasn't said. What does a humble person do? I'm sorry that my words hurt you. Tell me how I can better communicate with you in the future and I'll make a strong effort. Doesn't that solve a lot of problems? 
And I think it's worth noting when the goal of the New Testament church, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, is unity, let there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Let our speech be seasoned with salt. All of this comes to mind from the New Testament. The lesson is yours. You know, the only man who ever walked upon this earth who used his words perfectly were Jesus Christ, and he gives us an example of how to use our words. Will you turn to him? Will you submit to him? Will you follow him with faith, repentance, confession, and baptism? The invitation is yours as we stand in.